Good evening. Let us take some of these questions. Is God directing a life offered in service before conscious contact has been made? As uh, in the case of a student in the initial stages on this path. Actually, nobody enters this path unless God directs him. If it were possible for a human being to be on this path of their own accord, every human being in the world would be on this path because the fruitage is so rich. The peace, the satisfaction, the joy, the harmony is so abundant that everyone in the world would be on the spiritual path if they had the capacity to be there, but they haven't. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you, saith the Lord. And therefore, if you are on the spiritual path, it means that already the grace of God has touched you if you find it possible to continue on the spiritual path, it will mean that the grace of God is with you because you cannot make a single step on this path without the grace of God, without the finger of God having touched you. And so it is that regardless of what stage we may find ourselves, and regardless of what problems we may be called upon to go through, as Jesus was called upon to go through persecution and finally crucifixion, regardless of that, it was the grace of God that enabled him to go through because without the grace of God, he couldn't have taken that persecution. Without the grace of God, he couldn't have taken the crucifixion. And so it is that no one will ever be found on the spiritual path unless they have been touched by the grace of God. Could you very kindly tell us how to deal with inertia? Here too, without the grace of God, there'll be no progress. The question always with inertia on the spiritual path has to do with this. The person is seeking something, but not God. And of course, it is quite a strain, and inertia does come in. But where there is a love for God, there is no inertia. I have never yet heard a mother ask how to overcome inertia in caring for her child. Quite impossible to conceive, isn't it? Because there is no inertia where there is love. And so where there is a love of God, where there is a love of truth, there could be no inertia. And so the only answer to that would be find some reason to love God. There must be, everyone can find some reason to love God. I know from experience that at first it's very difficult. Look out at this world and you hardly find anything that you would want to thank God for. But as you get to looking behind the scene, you will soon observe that without God we would be lost. And so it is that gratitude comes easy. And with gratitude comes a love. Is there a shortcut to the dispersal of maya? If so, it's being kept secret from us. Whoever has found it is taking it away somewhere. How can we help those individuals who have not actually asked for help? Now, this is too broad a question. There are members of our family who may not ask for help, yet their illness or lack or limitation may be a burden on us. And certainly we have every right to try, through our spiritual understanding, to set them free. 
and in some cases we can succeed. If this question has to do with uh, strangers whom we would like to see made well or distant relatives, there's no answer to that. We have no right. You know, sometimes I wonder if we really and truly believe in freedom, if freedom and liberty really are a passion with us, or if we only think of our own freedom and liberty. Everyone in the, on the face of the globe has the right to live their own lives, and they have the right to die if they want. They have the right to be drunk or a right to be sober because they are working out their own destiny. Now, insofar as is possible, we should leave everyone alone to work out their own destiny except those who turn to us for help. The attitude that I have is this. If I want to live this spiritual life and probably even die as the world would see it without me uh, medical aid, I should be allowed to live and I should be allowed to die. It is my demonstration. But on the other hand, if my neighbor or my family want medical help, heaven knows I will not stand in their way. They are leading their own lives and they have their own demonstration to make and if they want to live by medicine, they can. And if they want to die by medicine, they can. It is their own demonstration. And to me, that is the very essence of liberty and of freedom, that we permit everyone to do as they please. Now, do you not see that very often, if we are allowed to suffer long enough and hard enough, that we may be driven to God? Whereas if somebody saves us our suffering, we can become so content with our health and supply that God just doesn't enter our scheme of life. And so it is that unless it was someone affecting my own demonstration, I would certainly leave this world alone to live and die as it sees fit. You often speak of the contact and the mystical experience. How would you differentiate between them? Degree. In degree, the contact is an awareness of the presence of God, but a mystical experience goes far deeper than that. It goes into the realm of an actual period of time in which one is living, actually consciously one with God. In the Gospel of St. John at the marriage feast in Cana, it is said, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Please can you tell us why Jesus made this reply at this particular moment? Are you speaking about that woman, what have I to do with thee? That remark is usually attributed to the fact that that he was trying to indicate that he was living his life separate and apart from his human mother and was not listening to her, obeying her, taking orders from her, or considering her in his spiritual life and demonstration. Whether or not this is so, I do not know because it is one of those passages that might well have uh, been changed through many, many translations. On the other hand, running through that is a favorite theme of the masters, that you must leave mother and brother, sister, father, and all of these for my sake. In other words, that in our spiritual demonstration, we are not to be influenced by even our closest relatives, but if necessary, ignore what their wishes or desires may be and follow our own light. Please will you say whether the following is a correct concept of forgiving one's enemy. 
Since there is only one being, I have no enemy out there to forgive. It is I who need forgiveness for having entertained a false sense of my neighbor, for having attributed to him a selfhood other than the divine and then called him my enemy. And that is partly true. You will find this subject covered quite at length in the chapter Love Thy Neighbor in Practicing the Presence and in the chapter Relationship of Oneness in the new book The Art of Spiritual Healing. And incidentally, those two chapters are the chapters that I use and recommend for all problems of human relationships at any level. And for that reason, that in the last analysis, we do have to see that I, God, is the individuality of all being. I, God, is the life being the qualities and quantities of individual being. And therefore, when we are beholding an enemy, we are actually beholding the carnal mind or the belief in two powers. And this, of course, is the dream existence or mirage. And our recognition of it as such is that which destroys the carnal mind and its picture, the enemy. In uh, the Gospel of Matthew, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This passage describes exactly the entire theme of the message of Christ Jesus, that which was originally intended to be Christianity. John the Baptist, as a prophet, and there is none greater than he, and yet he that is least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. In other words, regardless of how fine, honest, pure you may be according to the Ten Commandments regardless of how you obey the law and to what extent you obey the law you still are least less than the least of those in the kingdom of heaven because John the Baptist, in his obedience to the law, was obedient only to the law. He made the law his God, and thereby forgot the one true God. So it is that the actual mission and message of Christ Jesus was this. You have heard it said of old. And then we have a long list of what ye heard said of old. And uh, we have the law of Moses. And we have all the laws of the synagogue. But Christ Jesus came not to give the law but grace. Not to put us 
under obedience to the law, but lift us out of the necessity of law into grace. Now, rightly understood, a Christian should be living under two commandments and should be measuring his life and conduct only by those two commandments. Do I love the Lord my God with all my heart and with all my soul, with all my mind? Do I love my neighbor as myself? Now, when an individual takes these two commandments and begins to work with them, he finds, of course, that they have a meaning far greater than what appears merely in the words. In other words, what do we mean by thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind? Now you see, this is a passage that is passed over, quoted, repeated, whereas it should be taken into meditation for not less than a year, if not every day of the week, certainly every other day of the week, for at least a year, until we have an understanding of what it means to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, because Loving God is a very difficult thing to do for anyone coming out of the human scene. God has not been seen, heard, tasted, touched, or smelled. God has not come within the realm of a person's immediate experience. And in the human life, one has experienced so much of trial and tribulation that we have the right to wonder, why should I love God? with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my might. And as a human being, I think you can well agree that there really is no reason because God is not doing much for the human race. God is not doing too much for humankind if you can judge by newspapers, televisions, radios. The human race is getting along very badly and uh, God seems to be doing nothing about it. And of course, this makes one wonder, how can I love the Lord my God supremely, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul? And you will find right here the wisdom in that statement that the things of God are foolishness with man, but the things of man are equally foolishness with God. It is only in your meditation and contemplation that you will begin to perceive what heretofore you have taken for granted without realizing. But for the activity of God, the love of God, the laws of God, we really would be in trouble. In other words, without God actually governing this universe, think what would be happening in the realm of the stars and the planets, the earth, the other worlds. Without the actual presence and power and law and love of God, think what would be happening in the realm of our plant life, vegetable life, animal life. Think of the disasters that could happen if roses happened to grow on apple trees and apples only grew at the Arctic Circle. As you begin really to lift up your eyes unto the hills, as you mount spiritually, and begin to perceive God in action in this universe, 
eventually you will be led to one of the greatest revelations that could come into your life for you will discover that there are no disasters in the kingdom of God no sins and no diseases and no deaths that all of this is in the realm of man and the things that man governs and controls and then you will see why you should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul then you will understand that only the grace of God has given us not only life but a spiritual life which is perfect immortal complete bountiful you do not perceive this on the human level because looking at this human level you witness what the hand of man has done to us you witness what man's inhumanity to man has done to us and what man's ignorance of truth has done to us and you're almost apt to blame God whereas lift up your eyes into the hills lift your consciousness above this earth plane and begin to look at what is taking place behind the visible world as we have brought out here either in this class or in the lecture series before the class go to the park and watch these new blooms coming in in flowers and fruits watch these forces of nature as they operate season after season after a pattern laid down by the divine as we begin to perceive even in the tiniest measure that only the grace of God and only the gift of God makes life possible we can go a step further and eventually do go a step further more especially after we have seen how it is that it is the qualities that the human race has evolved through this belief in two powers that causes our difficulties and it enables us to eradicate those traits from ourselves in other words as we begin to perceive that ignorance and hate jealousies animosities biases bigotries are responsible for all of the troubles on earth do you not see how simple it is for us to say how foolish I would be to indulge those to add to the weight of the world's troubles by allowing myself to be an instrument for hate or jealousy or envy or malice or lust or greed or bias or bigotry it is only once you begin to perceive that these qualities of the human race are the very qualities that have us bound up in wars cold wars and hot wars winning wars and losing wars have us bound up in lawsuits have us bound up in the jealousies of the religions look into this thing meditate on God until you have received the assurance that in the kingdom of God there are no impurities there are no discords no inharmonies that the laws of God are absolute laws they never change they are the same from everlasting to everlasting and then you begin to perceive how it is that we as humans really are destroying this earth we are responsible for the disasters on the earth and you begin to perceive how and why this is and it makes it such a simple matter to say heaven forbid that I should add to the burdens of this world by maintaining in myself these qualities that I now see are wrecking the universe preventing peace on earth not only between nations not merely between differing ideologies 
But if you will, look at these battles between the different denominations and sects of Christianity. Look at these warfares between one group and another group, all claiming to be doing it in the name of Christ, which you surely know can't be truth. So it is that you eventually begin to see that peace on earth, harmony on earth, will come if it comes to you, if it comes to me, in proportion as we could live. If we as a group of a few thousand people could live without hates, animosities, jealousies, if we could live without wars, without lawsuits, do you not see that this would be a leavening influence in consciousness that would rapidly spread around the globe. But do not believe that anyone can live that life by being obedient to the Ten Commandments, because they can't. Their reason hasn't been reached. It is only when you actually perceive that it is uh, these human traits and qualities based on the belief in two powers, based on the belief in good and evil, that is causing human wreckage, that instantly you can be healed of those very qualities, because now their foolishness has been revealed to you. So it is that with meditations, quiet ponderings, spent on this subject, of actually leaving the realm of what you see here, taste, touch, and smell, and go behind it until you see what it is that operates through laws of God, and until you perceive what is operating in the mind of men. And then you will see how easy it is to love the Lord thy God. I have explained this to a class recently and I can't remember whether or not I've explained it to you. I think I have. How this idea of gratitude unfolded. That we should really never be grateful for anything that comes to our experience. I mean, there's no need to be grateful for the good that comes into my experience because if it isn't a universal good, what good is it? The point of gratitude is, and the thing to be grateful for, is that which is available to all of us universally and uniformly. In other words, think how grateful we should be for the laws of nature that provide us with the food we eat, the air we breathe, the rain that is so important in our experience the seasons of the year. Think what gratitude should fill us to know that regardless of what country we travel in on the face of the globe, two times two are always found to be four. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do, or do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do. In any country and every country, music is music, mathematics is mathematics. The scientific laws are the same in every country on the globe. You can build automobiles anywhere as long as you know the laws of automotive engineering. You can build airplanes or drive them. Think, think only of how grateful we must be in watching God reveal universally, uniformly, individually and collectively his laws, that we may avail ourselves of them in all of our modern transportation, modern kitchen gadgets, modern science, modern everything. Think, all of these are products of laws that have existed ever since time began. When you stop to think of this, you really find your heart welling up with gratitude So, 
once we have perceived a reason for loving God supremely, it is easy to love God supremely and acknowledge God in all our ways and acknowledge God as omnipotence and omnipresence because in these meditations we have actually had revealed to us omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience. We have actually come to the experience of seeing that these three words are really truth. And not only that they are truth, they are the truth of being upon which we can rely for our life's demonstration. And then we really can love God supremely. And then as we go to the next, to love thy neighbor as thyself. When we think of our neighbor as a human being, you know how ridiculous it is to talk about loving thy neighbor as thyself. You know that it really isn't intelligent to ask anyone to love their neighbor, especially some of the neighbors we can think about. But once you begin to perceive the Master's teaching, call no man on earth your father. There is only one father, and that makes us all brothers and sisters. Throughout this globe, after you've spent a few hours pondering that, you really look around this globe with an entirely different idea. You will be thinking of the men and women of this world with an entirely different idea. You begin to notice this. If you look to an individual as a human being, you are going to find selfishness in the highest degree because all humanhood is built on selfishness. That is the primal element of humanhood, the law of self-preservation, kill anybody else as long as I stay alive, deprive anyone else as long as I stay alive, compete with anyone else until he's bankrupt as long as I stay solvent. This is human history. This is human relationships at its present level of civilization. Build greater bombs and throw them first. You know, we're really not building these bombs just for Fourth of July uh, celebrations. They're really being bombed with the idea of wiping out races, peoples, continents. And if you think for a minute they're not being built for that, you're really fooling yourselves. They're being built for destructive purposes and for the destruction of whole nations. And it makes no difference who's building them. Don't ever let anyone tell you that they aren't being built for use. you think they aren't, just go back and remember the blockbusters of the last war. You'll find out they were built for use too, although we like to tell ourselves they were only built for defense. But defense is murder too. And they weren't only used for defense. Now, when you look at humans, and the actions that govern humans, you won't find any reason, except in isolated cases, for loving thy neighbor as thyself. It is only when you look up into those hills again, get up on the mountaintop of spiritual realization and begin to perceive the nature of the real man, your neighbor. Begin to perceive that God constitutes his being. God constitutes his life. God constitutes his mind and his soul. Begin to perceive the real nature of man, and not only you will love him, but you will bring out in him the nature that will compel you to love him. In other words, 
all spiritual demonstration of human relationships is dependent not on the other fellow, but on you. In other words, while here and there you may find an exception, you will find that this is the rule. The very moment that you begin to acknowledge that there is only one God, regardless of how many churches there may be, there is only one God. And that God is the creative principle of every man, woman, and child on earth. From the moment that you begin to live with that conscious realization, you begin to change the attitude of the other man toward you. You can do it with animals and watch it at that level and see how wonderfully it works instead of calling the dog a dog and a cat a cat, or instead of calling them bad or contrary, watch the difference when you rise up into the spiritual consciousness and realize God made all that was made. Anything that God did not make was not made. And all that God made was made of God's own selfhood. Therefore, all life is spiritual, all mind is intelligent, all being is divine, at every level of consciousness. And then watch the difference in the attitude of every form of living thing, even the vegetable and the mineral world. Watch their response to your realization that they are not inanimate, they are not inanimate matter, they are living particles. All part of the one life, an expression of the one intelligence. Now, when you begin to perceive God as the universal father and accept men and women as your brothers and sisters impersonally you begin immediately not only to love them but this remember is a spiritual love this has nothing to do with loving some people because they're good to you and being indifferent to others because they're indifferent to you this has no human connotation this means only the ability to realize God as the nature of individual being. It has nothing to do with picking out a person and concentrating on them with you are spiritual or you are the child of God, but it has to do with the recognition of God as constituting individual being. Then, finding that this is a form of spiritual love, just as forgiveness is, and <coughs> forgiving for the reason shown us here in this question. Forgiving because actually I am you. Forgiving actually because we realize that all wrong is committed only in ignorance. Nobody in the world ever committed a wrong after they were illumined. All wrongs exist only in ignorance. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, even if they are Judas Iscariot and his friends. Think of this. Every wrong that has been done to you or me or ours has only been do done because an individual did not know that I and the Father are one and all the Father hath is mine. Therefore, they were seeking to gain something for themselves that they thought we had. Regardless of what their offense, it was done in ignorance. It may have been ignorance of our true identity, ignorance of their true identity. The ignorance that has come down into the world through these religious biases and bigotries, all of which, you must remember, are taught to youngsters 
No one picks it up of their own accord. It has to be taught to them, or they wouldn't have it. And so it is, they pick it up ignorantly, not realizing that this is being given to them by someone they consider as authority, but someone ignorant, really, of what they're teaching. So it is. It is so easy to forgive once you understand the motive of those who are doing the wrongs. Once you see those who are tempted with lack and see them steal or lie, lie or cheat, you can almost understand it. And you can also understand that it is ignorance because if they had the illumination, they would know that I and the Father are one. They would know that God is the source of our good, not somebody else. And so it's only in their ignorance of their own heritage, of their own relationship with God, that one would lie or steal or cheat. So it is. Here are two commandments which would change obedience to which or understanding of which would change the very lives of every person on the face of the globe and render wars impossible, lawsuits impossible, wrongs, injuries impossible. But you can also see that to attain that means attaining a height of consciousness. It means attaining a realization of one's identity. It means attaining the realization of the identity of all men, since there is but one Father, one creative principle. It would be possible to have 10,000 times 10,000 religions and no discord among them if all would agree that there is only one God. At the present time, the agreement is there is only one God, but it's ours. But the very moment that all churches would agree there is but one God, do you not see how that would wipe out most of the hates from the face of the earth? Because most of the hates are only engendered by the belief that we have the one true God and you are going to the other region. Well, to make this transition from living under the law to living under grace means that it is necessary to rise above the limitations of the human mind with its two powers, its good and its evil, it's wrong and it's right. It means rising above judging by appearances. It means understanding the spiritual nature of your being and of mine and of his and of hers and of witnessing that which takes place. You know, it is said that all life lives off of other forms of life. It has been pointed out that the cats, for instance, chase the birds and kill them, and the dogs chase birds and kill them, and the lions chase the uh, smaller animals in the wilds. And it is considered that this is their nature. Don't ever believe it. This is human nature which they are patterning. It is not their nature at all, and I have been witnessing this for as many years as I am in this work. I have taken literally dozens upon dozens of cats and dogs and given them a treatment and watched that never again did they chase birds. It is not the nature of a cat or a dog to chase a bird. It is the nature of the human to prey upon the lesser forms and the animals in our consciousness nearly take on our consciousness. 
And the moment you free them from it, they are freed. Not only that, we go a step further. When you treat spiritually an animal, and you know you're not giving it an oral treatment and telling it to read 12 pages of a book, do you know that after you have given an animal a treatment that that animal not only knows you, even if it never did before, but that from that moment on there is a bond between you and that animal that that animal never forgets or lets go. That animal, if it sees you out in a crowd, will run after you. It will find you wherever you are. Merely from the spiritual bond that has been established by your treatment, and I have been witnessing this for 30 years, and I know how very, very true it is. Once we establish a bond with an animal, that animal is a lifelong companion. That animal would recognize us anywhere at any time, even if it had never seen us before we gave the treatment. Watch these things with your animals, and then you will know what a joy you've got ahead of you when you begin to realize that there is a spiritual bond between every human being on earth because of our divine sonship, meaning our brotherhood and sisterhood. But this spiritual bond that unites us only takes place after we have given the treatment. Only in our case now, it is not necessary to give a, an individual an individual treatment because this really has to do with a mode of life, loving God and our neighbor. And the moment I recognize God to be the one Father, the one creative principle, the moment I recognize all men everywhere, all women, all children everywhere, to be part of my spiritual household, of my spiritual family, Instantly I have set up this spiritual bond. And with the rare exception of those who are really adamant, adamant in their error or evil for a time, with the exception of those, all of the world responds to me as a brother or sister with impersonal love. And you note it, wherever we travel, and not only among infinite way students, I don't know, we find it in the hotels, with the help, in transportation, with the help. Wherever we travel, wherever it is, this invisible bond comes to the surface and uh, reveals relationships that you cannot really even speak about. You begin with your own meditation. Take this form of meditation for a year of rising above the appearance world and trying to see what God's relationship is to this world, how God operates, how God's laws maintain and sustain. Stay way up there watching God maintain, sustain this universe, even in bringing forth life every season. There too, you know, from appearances, you would judge that there are deaths every year, that trees die, plants die, flowers die. There is no such thing. It is only that outer shell or form that drops away. The life itself never dies. That is just exactly as if we lost a hand or an arm. It does not mean we have died. And if we lost all two hands and two feet and two arms and two legs, we still have not died. Just bits of the shell have been thrown away. And so it is that even at the ultimate experience that we call passing from sight, we do not die. It is only the shell that drops off 
making room for that next one, just as your dormant rose bush is now making room for the rose bush that is to come, the roses that are to come on that bush next. And so it is that as the fruit is taken from the tree, life remains, the life of the fruit remains, and in due season it will push forth more forms. And so you will find that your life is indestructible because God is your life, and you never lose it. All you lose are the shells, the outer forms, and that only for the reason of taking on new ones. So it is, when you realize the word I, and now you close your eyes, and to yourself, gently, softly, say I, I, I. That I is not anywhere inside my body. That I is not my body, it is me. But I could be examined from head to foot and nobody would find me in the body for I am not in the body. I am not in the body. I am the intelligence which uses this body. I am the life which uses this instrument. I am the soul which functions on earth, but I am not in the body. Actually, I fill all space. Actually, I am as omnipresent as God because I and my Father are one. And all of the immortality of God is mine, and all of the omnipresence of God is mine. I am omnipresent. And uh, in a small measure we prove that with our power of memory, since we can instantaneously travel to any place we have ever been. And it only takes a, great, a, a greater degree of practice to be able to travel to where you never have been and to see it and to describe it. It is just as possible to be instantaneously in any country on the globe where you have not been as it is for you this instant to be in any place in the world where you ever have been. It is merely a matter of training. And the reason is omnipresence. That is why it is often said there is no such thing as an absent treatment. Or it is often said that absent treatment is as good as present treatment. Both statements are correct. Absent treatment by which we mean treating somebody who is not in our physical presence is just as effective as treating someone in our physical presence because the I that I am and the truth which heals is omnipresence and it is already where the patient is. And again to say that there is no such thing as absent treatment is also true because it means I am not absent from you even if you are in Australia. Why? Because I am omnipresence. I fill all space. I am from everlasting to everlasting. I am here and I am there. And I am neither low here nor low there, for I do fill all space. So it is, as you begin to perceive the nature of the I that I really am, as you begin to perceive that I am not confined to time or space, that I am not limited, again you will perceive that this is the relationship of, this is the relationship, the identity rather, of every individual. 
and you will know that I am you. I am he. I am that I am. I am thou. And so you will understand that there is one selfhood in the sense that there is only one life, only one mind, only one soul, only one being, and that is individually but infinitely expressed. And yet it is always the one self. And so you see that as I know this truth, and I can only know it through enlightenment, I cannot know it through ignorance, I only know it through enlightenment. And when I have the enlightenment to know that I am you, do you not see that what I do to you, I am doing to myself? And if I do good unto you, it is really returning unto me. And if I do evil unto you, it is really returning unto me because I am you, because there is but one selfhood, and that which we do to ourselves we do to others. That which we do to the others, we are doing unto ourselves. The moment you begin to know this, do you not see that you don't need a law to keep you good? But now you have deprived yourself of the capacity to be evil because evil is now nonsensical. It is ludicrous. In the light of the truth, that I am he, and I am thou, and thou art me. And we are one. You are in me, and I am in you, and we are in God. Do you see how this clarifies the Master's teaching and shows us our true identity in each other, as part of each other, members of one body of the household of God. And this makes loving God so easy and makes loving our neighbor as ourselves so easy because now we understand the nature of God and the nature of ourselves and of each other. And we wonder why we ever let appearances cheat us of these joys and harmonies. And the answer is ignorance. We were not told. Only the mystics of the world have taught us these truths. None of these truths are new. None of these truths uh, have been invented or discovered by any individual. They are universal truths that have been revealed to certain individuals at all times in every era in human history. Certain individuals have had the same truth revealed to them and they have repeated it over. And that is why the Master said, this doctrine is not mine. but his that sent me. And as you study them, you'll find that almost everything he taught is now available in manuscripts that existed centuries before he was on earth, proving that he was not giving a new teaching, but that he was giving again the mystical teaching. And the mystical teaching is that which is beyond the law, under grace. And the mystical teaching is the teaching of enlightenment, illumination. And so when you read of the enlightened masters, the illumined masters, in each case you will find that they are those who knew I, and who knew I was my identity and your identity and God's identity, and that made a oneness. And in that oneness, we can love God supremely and each other as ourselves. Thank you.